Good morning. Welcome to our morning service at Fountain of Life Baptist Church. I hope that you're glad to serve a risen Savior. We live in a dark world with lots of problems, but we have a Savior that can save anyone. We're going to start with Jesus Saves. We have heard the joyful song. Oh 
That's what the place that God wants us to get in our Christian lives, that God, I have no idea what you want for me today, but I say yes, and I'm ready for it. And let's ask for God's blessing. Maybe if you're not quite there, let's ask for God's preparation in our hearts, that he will ready us to receive his word. Let's open together in prayer. And then we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 24. If you want to take your Bibles there as we continue through the life of David in the book of 1 Samuel, let's pray and ask for God's blessing. Lord, we thank you for meeting with us today. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve for you to take the time and come down and give yourself to us and open your will to us and open your word to us. But we're thankful that you are all, always ready to do that and, and consistently doing that. I pray that you'd help us to prepare our hearts to be ready to receive whatever you have for us today in the name of Jesus. And we pray all this. Amen. Temptation is when the devil 
brings a God-given desire for a God-given thing, combines it with a lie, and twists it all together um, into something sinful. Temptation is part of life. It's part of the Christian life. But when the devil comes to us and tempts us to sin, he will always do it with what God has started off with as a good thing. For instance, it's God's will for us to be happy. God didn't create man wanting him to be miserable, but the devil will twist the desire to be happy into something sinful. It's God's will that we have provision. God wants to take care of all of our needs, but the devil wants to twist the desire for provision into something sinful so that you will steal and so forth. Um, even the, the things that we desire naturally as humans, they are not wrong. For instance, God uh, has designed us with desires for happiness and pleasure and satisfaction, power, provision. And God has promised us as believers that we will have all of these things eventually. Some things now, some things later, some things it's, it's not the right time, it's not the right way. Uh, and so this is the way that the devil uses temptation. He will take the things that God has designed as good, and he will take our desires that God designed as good, and then apply them in a way that is simple. We need to learn how to say this with temptation. The devil, not right now, and not in that way. And that type of temptation is something that comes to David something that he faced in 1 Samuel chapter 24. Let's turn there. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24, I've entitled the message today, Temptation to Rush Ahead. And this is what David is faced with. He's on the run. He's been on the run from Saul for some time now. He is now in the wilderness of En Gedi, hiding in a cave with his 600 men. And Saul comes after him. 1 Samuel 24 and verse 1. It says, and it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. So Saul, it says at the end of chapter 23, was called away from chasing David so that he could go and fight the Philistines who had invaded the land. And I believe that Saul fought them as harshly and as quickly as possible so we could get that out of the way and get back to uh, our scheduled programming of chasing after David. And David, I'm sorry, Saul, he is not running the kingdom. He's the king. But he's not running the kingdom as the main priority in his life. His main priority in his life, his normal, is chasing after David. He takes brief breaks from chasing after David to get back to doing his real job. And then as soon as that's done with, he gets back uh, to chasing after David. What a, a miserable life Saul has wrapped himself up in. And, and so as, we, as Saul chases after David, he comes to this cave and I want to see several things about David's situation. Chapter 24 of 1 Samuel is one of the highlight, shining moments of David's life. He's going to have a similar one in chapter 26, almost a cookie-cutter scenario. But it's where you see David being a man after God's own heart, really shining. And so the first thing I want to look at is David's principles. David lived his life by the principles of God and of God's word, even when faced with temptation uh, many times. And so look at verse 3. It says, And he came to the sheepcoats, by the way, where was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe 
privily. Now, this Bible verse that David's men give to him is not found in the Bible. Found, you know, it's like you go all the way through the end of the book, uh, and into the Apocrypha, there's the book of ramifications. And David, his men bring him and say, uh, remember that Bible verse when God told you, I'll deliver your enemy into your hand, you can do anything you want to with him. Well, God had never promised David that he would be able to kill Saul uh, and so forth. But David lives, uh, he, he sees through these words of his men and he does the right thing. Now, it says that Saul came into the cave to cover his feet. Different people have different ideas. It's kind of split down the middle maybe as far as those that believe covering the feet means to use the restroom to relieve himself or to take a nap. Uh, and so there are two places in the Bible where it talks about this. The other is in the book of Judges when Ehud is the judge and he goes to kill Eglon. And Eglon goes into his summer parlor to cover his feet. It seems that he is using the restroom there, but uh, we're not maybe for sure in both instances. Maybe he did both. Maybe he used the restroom and then laid down to take a nap. I lean toward that it means to use the restroom. Uh, several of the other uh, Bible versions even translate it that way to relieve himself. Uh, it doesn't really matter that much which one it is. But either way, Saul, he goes into the cave alone. He, all of his men are outside the cave. Uh, maybe if he were taking a nap, they'd be standing guard, uh, protecting him. In chapter 26, they're going to be out in a field, all of them sleeping, and they all surround Saul. He's in the very middle in a place of protection so that no one would be able to get to him, so to speak. And so maybe, but either way, uh, when you see what happens here, as there is talking, as there is whispering in the cave and in this conversation, maybe between multiple men, maybe even uh, the tensions are high and maybe even the voices get a little bit raised. But I think they're trying to do their best to talk softly. Nevertheless, if Saul is in there and he's totally aware and using the restroom, maybe he doesn't, maybe he hears them. And also what it says that, that David privately cuts off the skirt of Saul's robe. If he's using the restroom, maybe he takes his robe off and he leaves it uh, in one area and he goes and uses the restroom and comes back. Uh, if he's asleep, then you see how he doesn't notice uh, the cutting off of the robe. But either way, uh, Saul is there and he doesn't know. Maybe God is involved with him, not perceiving or noticing. Uh, David here faces strong pressure from his men, not only to cut off the robe, neither was totally I, David's idea to cut off the robe. Their idea was cut off his head, you know, slit his throat, get this over with now. And he faces pressure from a large crowd of people. Maybe the bulk of his 600 men are pushing and urging him to do this. And wow, what pressure, I'd say peer pressure, but they're not really his peers, uh, but all of them together are urging him uh, and he withstands that temptation. Proverbs 1.10 says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. And how do you know if someone is a sinner enticing you? Well, everyone's a sinner. But if someone's enticing you to do sin, then they are being a sinner at that moment. They could be your friend. They could be righteous all the time. But if at that moment they're encouraging you to do something wrong, then the Bible says, If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. And so David withstands their pressure. Um, we need to beware of the temptation, we've talked about this before, the temptation to situational ethics, which means it's usually right to do this, but, or it's usually wrong to do this, but if the situation calls for it, then it could be right. It's usually wrong to kill someone. It's usually wrong to murder, but if that person has a history of chasing after you, then that could actually be a good thing because it could, you know, end the scenario. Uh, you could just chalk it up to self-defense. Usually it's wrong to tell a lie, but in this scenario, if you can tell a lie to get out of trouble or even to save your life or even to protect someone else, then that wrong can be right in this situation. Usually it's wrong to steal. But if you are right on the doorstep of starvation and you think you might actually starve to death, then it could be okay in that situation to steal food, 
to save your life and preserve it. And you see how the devil can come in and get a crack in the door and he can throw that door eventually step by step wide open. And so many people start that way. They start doing something that is usually wrong in their minds, but just for now, just for today, there's an ex exception. God will make an exception. God will understand. And this is situational ethics. It's often called the end justifies the means. You can do whatever you need to as long as the end destination, as long as the goal is good, as long as it's for the greater good. Then if you had to crack a few eggs along the way, if you got to get your hands dirty, no, no big deal. No, right is always right. Wrong is always wrong. And two wrongs don't make a right, which is what David's men are trying to get him to do. Saul's doing wrong chasing after you. Why don't you do wrong and it'll actually be right for what it's accomplishing. No, right is always right. And so David, he leaves his men shaking their heads in disbelief, shaking their heads. But God is nodding his head in approval of David's doing the right thing. Romans chapter 12 and verse 19 shows the way that we should treat those that have been doing us wrong. It says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Specifically, God's place. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, Thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And here's what David does, verse 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. When David is faced with the opportunity to get even, instead he just leaves it in God's hands and he blesses Saul. He sends him away uh, well and good and still alive. And so first of all, we see David's principles. Then number two, we see David's conscience. Because even the small thing that he does do pricks his conscience immediately. And some would say, oh, nothing wrong with what you just did. I mean, you could have killed him. But David has a very sensitive conscience. We read about it in verse 5. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. None the wiser. Saul had no idea that he was just now in the clutches of death and he had escaped uh, with, his, with his very life. So we see the very sensitive conscience that David has here, which is a good thing, by the way. It's not a manly thing. It's not a badge of honor to do something wrong and not even phase you, not even feel it anymore. Uh, now, he, he doesn't, again, kill Saul, but it only cuts off the skirt of his robe. But what that does is a little bit of a disrespect or dishonor to him. You could say that the robe, and by the way, we've seen the clothing, we've seen the robes several times in the book of 1 Samuel. You see Saul uh, ripping Samuel's clothes. You see David, uh, as Jonathan takes off his, priest, his um, not priestly, but his princely garments and puts them on David, that the clothes represent something. Uh, and so when Saul's robe here is cut, David seems to be cutting off a little bit of his, of the representation of his kingdom or saying, you're going to lose this. God's going to take this away from you and a little bit um, shaming him or dishonoring him. And so that pricks his conscience. And he says, I shouldn't have even done that. I don't even want to, I don't want to kill. I don't want to lift up my hand against, I don't even want to disrespect in any way the Lord's anointed because he is God's man that he has put here to rule and reign. And it's my job to uh, respect him and give him the honor uh, that is due his place. What a, what a moment. How is your conscience, by the way? Do you have a conscience that if you do something even small by some people's measures, that you're pricked by it? 
oh man, I shouldn't have done that. And you have people surrounding you. What do you mean you shouldn't have done that? That was nothing. Uh, look what he's doing. Look what he's doing. Look what I do all the time. That's nothing. Don't worry about it. Be careful about ignoring the little pricks in your conscience. Jeremiah 3.3 3 shows the nation of Israel at one point. It says, therefore, the showers have been withholden and there hath been no latter rain. And thou, they're in a moment of sin here, and thou hadst a whore's forehead, thou refusedst to be ashamed. Someone that is a whore gets to the place in her life where she kind of has to shut off her conscience. She felt bad the first time that she gave her body away. But little by little, it came to not bother her until eventually she just has a whore's forehead. And there's no blush, there's no shame. They refuse, the nation of Israel here, refuses to be ashamed. And many Christians can get to that point. They've done something wrong over and over again, doesn't even bother them anymore, and they refuse to be ashamed. Ephesians 4 and 19 talks about getting to this place, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness, with greediness. What a, a dangerous place to get. This is for uh, possible for Christians to get here, to be past feeling. I felt bad about what I did, but then I kept doing it. I pushed through and now I'm past feeling and nothing bothers me anymore. There's no more uh, conscience. There's no more uh, warning system. Many vehicles today are equipped with different types of warning systems when you're about to bump into something. Maybe you're in a car and you're getting close to something and all of a sudden it goes beep, 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 like, whoa, you're getting close, don't smash into this. And so this beeping will warn you. Or maybe sometimes there will be an automatic braking system, like it totally takes over. Okay, moron, you're about to smash into that, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna step in and I'm gonna stop you from doing that. And those are great blessings. Imagine if you're in a car that theoretically has that, but it's not working. It's malfunctioning. And you're banking on it beeping. You know, you're backing up. Oh, you're starting to get close. Oh, it's going to beep when I get close. Wham! You know, and because of the malfunction, you smash into something. Maybe you're going full speed ahead and you smash into something. You destroy both it and your vehicle. Everything is total. Everything's horrible. And it could have been avoided if the warning system was working properly. That's like a conscience. And your conscience should be warning you about things, but now you have jumped over the fence. You've ignored your conscience, and now it doesn't even bother you anymore. Here's what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. What a picture that is. A conscience that is seared with a hot iron. Imagine that you've touched a stove, hot stove, and tss, ah, the burning flesh, you can smell it, you can feel it, it's so awful and you've burned through that first layer of the skin. You've burned through the second layer. You know, the epidermis is ruined, and now you've gone down and you've damaged the nerves in your hand it's to the point where you don't even feel anything anymore. Your hand has totally lost its feeling. Now you can go put your hand on a hot stove. You don't even feel it. Ah, I don't feel it. I'm a man. now you're still destroying your hand. You're still doing much further damage to your hand, but you don't even feel it anymore. We need uh, the nerves. We need those sensors to detect pain so that we know to pull away so that we don't damage and destroy ourselves. And those with a seared conscience have done danger. They've done damage to their conscience and now uh, and by the way, for a Christian, the Holy Spirit works together with your conscience. But if you ignore the Holy Spirit and say, ah, I don't care, I'm going to do it anyway, you will sear your conscience and you can get to the place where you can do just about anything and it doesn't bother you. And you can jump off a cliff, you can smash into a wall, you can destroy yourself 
and it doesn't even bother you. What an awful place for a Christian to get to. David is the opposite of that. He has a very tender conscience. His conscience pricked him, and he responded to that right away. The way to fight against a seared conscience is to, every single time the Holy Spirit prods you to do something, you do that. Whenever he says, don't do something, you immediately stop. You never just jump over that wall. You never just plow on through because you know that it's, you're not only going to do wrong on this day, but you're going to damage your conscience in the future. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, quench not the Spirit. When the Spirit is speaking, don't turn him off. Don't ignore him. Don't quench him. When I was in college, there was a group of us friends that were sitting at a table eating lunch. We'd all gathered around. Uh, one of the guys got up to go get something, one more uh, dessert or something, uh, and we decided we we're going to play a little practical joke on him. One of the girls there at the table uh, took his fork and hid it under the table uh, in her lap. So it comes back. He's getting ready to eat. He's like, hey, where's my fork? Anybody see my fork? Uh, Anybody know where my fork is? And she says, no, I don't know where your fork is. And then two seconds later, she says, I lied. Here, I have your fork. I'm so sorry. Uh, and we all kind of chuckled and, and laughed at her like, oh, come on, you ruined the joke. Come on, you can't just prolong it. But one thing that stuck out to me was that this was a person who has a very tender conscience. And she couldn't just lie even in a joking way to play a practical joke on somebody. What is your conscience like? Do you have a tender conscience where you feel the Holy Spirit? Does God have to hit you over the head with a baseball bat? Or can God just whisper in your ear and you say, Oh God, forgive me of that. I'm sorry and, and turn away from it. David had a, a, a tender conscience. It's a great gift from God to have a, the conscience and the Holy Spirit. And don't sin against that conscience. You do that to your own destruction. Number three. In this chapter, the third thing we think, see about David is we see David's patience. He had been promised something by God, and now was the opportunity to seize on it. At least that's what his men told him. But instead, David is willing to wait. He knew that he was anointed to be king. He knew that it was rightfully his place. He doesn't know when the time is. But he was willing to wait and find out from God when the time is, instead of taking matters into his own hands. We often are tempted to rush ahead of God's will and God's timing for us. And by the way, the devil will often do this with things that are God-ordained for you. It is God's will for you to have something, but not right now and not like that. Imagine a dating couple. They're not married. They're just dating. They're getting to know each other. They really enjoy each other's company. They like each other. They get to the place where they believe they are going to get married. They believe and they've prayed and they believe it's God's will for them to get married. Their, their interests are aligned. They both believe that God has called them to do certain things. And so they start to get so comfortable with themselves. They involve themselves with each other sexually. But it's okay in their minds because, I mean, we're going to get married anyway. I mean, this is God's will for my life, this person. And so they move in together and they just start to live like they already are married because we're going to anyway, we might as well just do it now. And whenever people live that way, we're getting ahead of God. And by the way, we think that we just did something only just a little bit faster. But actually, here's what's happening. Here's what's taking place is that these two people are going into a special relationship and now without God's blessing, now without God's favor. Now they've called God's curse and judgment onto this relationship. And what could have been a very beautiful and God-ordained thing now is going to go forward with difficulty and trouble because the devil has come in and twisted something holy into something unholy. This is almost the same temptation that Jesus had when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. Remember Matthew chapter 4, I'll read verses 8 and 9. It says, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, 
if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now it was ordained by God for Jesus to have all the kingdoms of the world, right? One day God is going to put all things under his feet and he is going to be the ruler over the entire universe. That's ordained by God, but not right now and not like that. It wasn't yet the time for Jesus to take command of the universe in that way. The devil's the God of this world. By the way, the devil, Jesus never said to the devil, uh, what do you mean? I'm God. You don't have the, the right to give that to me. The devil right now is the God of this world. He has dominion over certain things under God's permission. But Jesus could have said, eh, I'm going to get it anyway. I might as well get it now. But he said, I'm not going to do it now. First, I've got to go to the cross and I'm not going to do it in that way. I'm not going to bow down to the devil. This is The devil is trying to get God to worship him. And God says to him, no, you're supposed to worship me. You know, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. And this is the way the devil comes to us. He tries to get us sometimes to, to take something that God wants for us, but not right now and not in that way. The devil is trying to get Jesus to circumvent the cross. But the cross was the way that God had ordained for Jesus to take over the kingdoms of the world. This is what it says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. It says, In being found in fashion as a man, he, Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what the devil seeming to offer Jesus on this day. You could have where you have all the kingdoms of the world and everyone bows down to you and that was going to come through the cross. The devil tried to get Jesus to take something good in the wrong way at the wrong time. And we need to watch out for that in our lives. It's at every turn. The devil wants to twist something that is holy and pure into something that is corrupt. In his time, he makes all things beautiful in his time. But we need to make sure we don't rush ahead of God and do it in our time. There's a certain French dish that I've actually never eaten but I've heard about called the souffle. Uh, and it's a very delicate dish, a very beautiful dish, what they say, very delicious when done correctly. And if you put just the right ingredients in, in just the right way, mix it and fold in the egg whites and everything in just the right way, and then you put it in the oven for just at just the right temperature, for just the right amount of time, then it rises into this beautiful, fluffy souffle. But if halfway through you get impatient, and you pull open, ah, I'm hungry now, I need to eat it, and you pull open that oven door, then the souffle is ruined, and it, it deflates, and it's too dense, and the whole thing is now worthless because you weren't patient, because you couldn't wait for it all to be done in the right way at the right time. And that's what the devil, and I'm not just trying to say that the devil's trying to ruin your souffle, but the devil wants to destroy your whole life, and he can do it in subtle ways. He says, here's a good thing. Why don't you just take it now? Uh, but David's patience is something to behold. Proverbs 20, verse 22 says, Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. Psalm 37, 34, Wait on the Lord and keep his way and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. This is exactly what happens in David's situation in David's life. He waited on the Lord, and eventually all that good came to him, and he didn't ruin it by rushing ahead of God. Beware of the temptation to rush ahead. The fourth thing that we see as we go on in 1 Samuel 24 is that we see David's humility. And so he lets Saul go. Saul starts to uh, go away. And then David addresses him in a very humble way. Look at verse 8. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth 
and bowed himself. So he humbles himself. He bows, you're the king and I'm not. And he bows before the king. Also in, down in verse 14, he's talking to him and he says, After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? Who am I? Uh, I, I'm no one special. Why are you chasing after me? And so David is very humble. He's able to pay great respect to Saul. And he honors Saul to his face instead of trying to show him up. He doesn't try to put him in his place. He doesn't say, you've been wicked chasing after me and I could have killed you, but I'm better than you. He, he doesn't try to put Saul in his place. He is very humble. He has a, a low view of himself. He could have said something like this, God has anointed me to be the next king. And who are you to chase after me? You got this all wrong. You're doing the wrong thing. He doesn't try to show up King Saul. He's very humble in, in his appeal to him. Do you view yourself as a somebody or as a nobody? Do you view yourself as deserving of wonderful things in life, of better than what you have. When people mistreat you, say, it's not fair, I deserve better than this. What's your view of yourself? That's very important in the decisions that you'll make. Think about Jesus when he came to earth. What was his view of himself? We read part of the Kenosis passage in Philippians chapter 2. It says that Jesus, when he came to earth, he made himself of no reputation. He didn't just make himself of low reputation. He made himself of no reputation. And later it says about the soldiers that they took him and they set him at naught, which literally means they made nothing out of him. They took the God of the whole universe and, and they made him zero. They made him nothing. But they were actually too late because he had already done that to himself. He had already humbled himself and made himself nothing. He had made himself a servant of no reputation. And so it was no big deal to him when the soldiers set him at naught. What's your situation in life like? What's your attitude toward yourself? Do you view yourself as somebody who deserves the things of life? When a Christian does God's will, when a Christian shares the gospel, what you have is literally you have a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. What a wonderful truth of sharing the gospel we have as Christians. But we're nothing special. We are just nobodies. We're just one beggar trying to tell another beggar where the food is, where the water is. On the one hand, as Christians, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ as having nothing and yet possessing all things. But on the other hand, we're just nobodies. And so may we have that view of ourselves and not try to lift ourselves up. David is very humble when he uh, appeals to King Saul. He must increase and I must decrease. That was the attitude of John the Baptist and that needs to be our attitude. How do you view yourself when somebody wrongs you? Do you take offense because you think you are better than that? You deserve to be treated better than that? How dare they do that to me? Or do you say, you know what, I'm no greater than my Lord. If they mistreated Jesus, they're also going to mistreat me. And I accept that. David is very humble. Number five is that we see David's mercy. Not only his humility before Saul, but his mercy toward Saul. And we see this in the conversation that he has with him. Starting in verse 9. It says, And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave, and some bade me kill thee. But mine eye spared thee, and I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, and Saul was literally his father, his father-in-law, Moreover, my father, see, yea, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand, and I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. As saith the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but mine hand 
shall not be upon thee. After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. The Lord therefore be judge and judge between me and thee and see and plead my cause and deliver me out of thine hand. One of the greatest ways that David could prove to Saul that it was all a lie. All the people that were in his ear saying, David's chasing after you. David hates you. David's trying to kill you. One of the ways that he could prove to him that that was not true, the greatest way, is by when he has opportunity to do just that, that he doesn't. That he takes Saul's life in his hand and he gives it to him and in mercy sends him away. Uh, maybe it was hearing about David getting the sword of Goliath from Nob. Remember, uh, hey, David got the sword of Goliath, and Saul says in his paranoia, oh, he's got a sword, he must be coming for me. And so he believes that he's lurking behind every stone trying to kill him. But it's the opposite, it's Saul chasing after David, trying to kill him. Uh, David is just trying to get He's not trying to get Saul. He's trying to get away from Saul. He's trying to save his life. But he wouldn't even kill him just to save himself from future attacks or to make the danger stop. Instead, he gave it to God. And he says, God, you be the judge. You avenge me of Saul. If that's your will, I give myself to you and I don't take matters into my own hands. So we see David's mercy. And so we've seen all these truths about David. First of all, uh, we saw his, um, his principles that he lived by. We saw his conscience being willing to um, do what's right. We saw his patience, not getting ahead of God's will in his life. We saw his humility. We saw his mercy. And all this we just put on the other side in contrast with Saul. And the sixth thing you want to see is Saul's temporary remorse. Now, it looks like remorse, what we're about to see, but later we'll see that it was once again only temporary. We see this starting in verse 16. And it came to pass when David had made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. And thou hast showed this day how that thou hast dealt well with me, for as much as when the Lord had delivered me into thine hand, thou killest me not. For if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? Wherefore the Lord reward thee good, for that thou hast done unto me this day. And now, behold, I know well that thou shalt be surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. Swear now, therefore, unto me by the Lord, that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me, and that thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore unto Saul. And Saul went home, but David and his men gat them up unto the hold. By the way, this is the story of David's life. After every episode, when you read all these, it's like a series, a drama series, or one episode after the other. And at the end of every single episode, it says that somebody goes home and David doesn't go home. He just goes back out into the wilderness. He's on the run again, on the, on the road again. You know, that's, that's David's whole life uh, is just living out on his own, living on the road. Saul is totally disarmed here by the mercy and kindness of David. He, it's totally unexpected out of left field him. There's no way that he ever thought anybody could live like this. He is surprised. He says, if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go well away? Nobody ever does that. I wouldn't do that. I would never do that. But you did that. And it's like his mouth drops open. He's almost speechless. He doesn't know how to respond. He doesn't know how to react. He is overcome by the goodness of David. And so at this moment... It's going to be temporary, but at this moment, he decides to put away his sword, to put away his malice, because he is disarmed by the kindness and the mercy of David. Rewarding good for evil puts us in elite company, if we will ever do this. It is rare. It's against human nature. 
but this is the way of Jesus and, and other great men of God in the Bible. But it's such a very rare thing that if you can ever reward someone good for the, the evil they do to you, you are in elite company. Uh, it will astonish those around us. Everyone knows that you should just take what you can get whenever you can get it in life. But if not, if you can rise above that, then you are a child of God. Uh, and, and you won't live this way if you really believe that the one who holds the universe in his hands holds your life in his hands. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God holds the whole universe in his hands? And now more specifically, more personally, do you believe that he is ordering every moment of your life and he's in charge of every moment of your life? Uh, Psalm 31, 15 says, My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. David, and by the way, David wrote that. David actually believes that to be true. He believes that God's in charge, that God has his life in his hands, and so he is able to give Saul his life back and say, I'm not going to take it into my own hands because God's got it all. God will take care of you. God will take care of me. David's not threatened by Saul's threatenings. And so Saul, even in this moment of temporary remorse, maybe we could call it fake remorse, but even in this moment of temporary remorse and shame, he manages to get around to trying to help himself. He says, you know, thank you so much. And by the way, will you sign on the dotted line right here? Will you swear to me that you're not going to kill me or wipe out my name, my legacy from my father's house? He is so self-seeking and self-serving at every moment of his life. Remember the time when he had lost the kingdom and uh, uh, Samuel has told him, God is done, you're, you're done with being king. And he says, okay, well, since we're in front of everyone, can you just turn and, and honor me and worship the Lord with me? He's always concerned about saving face. He's concerned about his reputation. He's concerned about his well-being. Saul can never in his life get to the place where he just says, I've sinned and God Whatever you want to do, I'm in your hands. It's never just, God, whatever you want to do. He always tries to hold on to something to help himself and to save himself. Uh, and what are you and I going to do when we are surrounded by people like that? Are we going to say, you know what, they're so selfish, they're self-serving, they're trying to get me, I've just got to take what I can get now. Are we going to be like Saul, self-serving, self-seeking, or are we going to be like David? that I'm just going to give myself to God. I'm just going to throw my life to the wind, so to speak, knowing that God is the one in charge of the wind. I'm not going to try to figure everything out. I'm going to have faith in God. I'm going to believe. I'm going to do what's right no matter what. I just want to end with this verse, Psalm 55, 22. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Do you know that? Do you believe that in your life? That even though everyone's chasing after you, every, even though everything is against you, if you cast your burden on the Lord, he'll sustain you and he'll make sure that you will never be moved. David's not a perfect man. He's had his ups and downs. But on this day, he shines as one that has opportunity to take vengeance. He's tempted to do it. He has 600 men pressuring him. But he says, nope, I'm going to give it to God. I'm not going to do that. Wickedness proceeded from the wicked. People do that type of thing, but it's not going to be me. I want God's will for my life in his time and in his way. And I'm not going to do anything to jeopardize that. May that be the prayer of our hearts today. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for David's example. Thank you for the humility that pours out of his life here. Thank you for the, the principled man that he is, that he's willing to be patient. He's willing to wait for what is his and not rush ahead. Help us in every area of life when we are tempted to take something that maybe you've ordained for us, but not now and not in that way. Help us to live by the principles of your word and leave ourselves in your hand and leave the timing of everything in your hand. We trust you. We believe that no good thing will you withhold from them that walk uprightly and help us to live like we believe that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hope you have a wonderful week and walk with God. God bless you.
Thank you for watching today. If you have made a decision to follow God in some way or would like prayer, let us know at flbc at cox.net. We would love to connect with you, pray for you, or send you some resources that can help you in your walk with God. If you would like to know more about how to go to heaven, visit us at folbaptist.com slash heaven. If you would like to give financially to support our ministry, you can do so at folbaptist.com slash give. Thank you, and God bless you.